All right. Hello, webinar attendees. My name is Marisa Morales, and I serve as the Vice President for Network Leadership with Campus Compact. Um, we're so happy that you can be part of uh, Campus Compact's national webinar series. This is the second year of this series. And today, our webinar is titled Using Student Engagement Data to Create Institutional Change. Um, and I'll be introducing our wonderful presenters shortly. But I just want to, um, again, do a plug for our uh, bi-weekly podcast series. Our upcoming one will be with Nancy Thomas around um, the uh, student data around voting. So be sure to check that out. Um, I co-host the web, uh, sorry, the podcast with Andrew Seligson, president of Campus Compact, and Emily Shields, who's the director of Iowa Minnesota Campus Compact. So you won't want to miss it. In addition, um, just save the date for our upcoming national conference that will be in Seattle. Uh, March 29th through April 1st. The title of the conference is Full Participation, The Promise of Democracy, Opportunity, and Voice. Uh, and we hope to make it our largest and most inclusive conference yet. So um, let me move on to the introductions. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Nola Boyle. Uh, Nola has supported the investment of community-engaged teaching and learning in higher education since 1997. As the inaugural director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Nazareth, Nazareth College uh, since 2010, uh, which is Nazareth College is in Rochester, New York. She oversees curricular and co-curricular community engagement, including the Center for Service Learning and facilitates the college's experiential learning requirement within the core curriculum. Boyle is also on the advisory council for Campus Compact New York, Pennsylvania, and is on the national board, uh, is, uh, is on the board of the National Society for Experiential Education graduating from their Experiential Education Academy in 2014. She's earned a BA in English from Stonehill College in Boston, Massachusetts, and her MA in Religious Studies from Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. Welcome, Nola. Next, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Lomondola, uh, who is the Director of Institutional Research at Nazareth College, and has been instrumental in creating a data-informed environment for strategic decision-making, planning, and assessment at Nazareth. Uh, Limandola has leveraged his background in analytic statistics and predictive modeling to collaborate across divisions on projects as to student success, retention, graduation, co-curricular and experiential learning, and overhauling the faculty workload model, uh, as well as administrative assessment and diversity inclusion. Limandola earned a BA in psychology from the University of Michigan, an MA in Brain and Cognitive Science from the University of Rochester and his PhD in Psychology from the University of Arizona. Welcome to both of you and thank you so much for uh, sharing this webinar with us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Radisson. Um, we have a, a team going here where Nick is going to share his screen and his slides and I'm going to play along here. Um, so excited to be able to talk to everyone today and learn from each other and at the end we'll have time for some Q&A again with the hopes that sharing our model will spark interest but also we can certainly learn from everyone um, present. Our goals today are really just to use Nazareth as an example of how one institution moves from data silos to a data warehouse. Um, with the goal of strengthening student retention and outcome efforts because of having all of the data fed into one um, warehouse. And our process, we're just offering us one institution's approach, again, to implement this curricular and co-curricular experiential learning data collection process. Um, by the end of today, we're hoping to also, and we will also share through Tableau data visualization dashboards with you and reports that certainly are utilized by our faculty and staff um, and show how we have used the data uh, to guide our outcomes and retention efforts. And just um, to get an idea of the landscape of what's out there, um, we want to be able to ask a couple questions. So if you all could just um, be prepared to have a temperature check happen for you. Um, Marisol is going to share some um, voting opportunities. So just for accessibility's sake, um, the first question just says, where is your institution at with regards to tracking student engagement data? So any type of experiential learning data, and you can click on more than one 
you know, is it unit based? Do you yourselves track what type of engagement your students are doing through your programming? Um, do you track it or do you know the knowledge rate of, of tracking through other departments? And are you able to connect this data? So you can just take a moment to look at number um, one. And then you can look at um, what happens with number two. And Matasol can certainly unmute and, and chat with us about how the voting happens. Number two is just your office already has a good working relationship with institutional research. Knowing all of this data collection, and, and it can happen in a number of different ways, an in-house um, tool can be developed like Nazareth has, uh, but there are a lot of vendors out there and a lot of reasons why people choose third-party providers. And so um, no matter what the case, you always need a good working relationship with your institutional research office. And so we're kind of just wanting to also gauge the temperature on you know, who out there on that call has that. Um, and Madison is telling me that she's also going to show the poll in a couple of seconds. So if you can keep moving on with your answers and say um, the third question of gauging whether or not your college has an experiential learning requirement. It can be a requirement in the general education or the core curriculum, which is how it is at Nazareth, or it can be a graduation requirement. And we do have one that is, you know, curricular and co-curricular tied to the core curriculum. So just also gauging the landscape of how institutionalized some of this is. And the fourth one, slight typo, but just type in the word or visualize the letter H for how are your data currently being used? Do you use this for assessment purposes? Do you use it to provide insight into how to reach out to the unengaged, the disengaged? Um, do you develop programming based on your data? So departmentally, divisionally, institutionally, or not at all? And the last question is a yes or no, very simple, asking you if you at your institution, you know, you at your office or your institution in general can be the, the colloquial we, currently link student engagement data, experiential learning data to retention and success efforts on campus. Perfect. So thank you all for taking the time to provide us a little landscape. If we were in a room, we could have dialogue here, but it's wonderful to have an idea of um, where we're at and how to kind of gauge what we talk about today um, with a little more specificity. So it looks like we are pretty even for, you know, whether or not at the same institution, your department tracks and other department tracks, and we have a quarter who are present who actually it's connected across the institutions. So that's exciting. Um, and we have a majority who have a good working relationship with their IR office, it's more exciting. Um, we have that benefit here at NAS as well. And majority, again, 81% have um, experiential learning requirements. So again, more reason to be able to track, know what's happening across the divisions of the college and use that data. And so right now the majority by a little hair, it's departmentally, and some are institutionally. So it could be that that's a, a both um, there, those 15, 14 individuals. Um, and then we have about 64%, about 23 respondents say that they are not using any of the data. So there could be a chance of having some insight and some action steps for how do you go back to your institution upon learning how one campus is doing this to say it, it can be done and, and what do we want to do. And by the way, we're also happy to have a conference call with individual colleges to dialogue around how we did it and see if it would resonate on your campus or not. Again, it's certainly um, something that Nazareth does specifically for us, but it, it can be replicated. Um, and so 13 people who um, actually do use it. So that's, that's exciting. So before, we um, launch into everything. We wanted to get that context and to let you know a little bit about Nazareth. We are a small, um, private, independent, so not religiously affiliated, although the, the name certainly um, can appear that, that it seems Christian. We are pride ourselves in a 
um, interfaith uh, focus and certainly bringing students together across difference to, to dialogue and, and appreciate each other and learn from each other. We have around 2,000 undergrads, 1,000 grads, um, private master's large institution, all the allied health professions and liberal arts in a residential suburban campus. So picture right there showing you it's, it is beautiful. Our mission um, is even more lovely. It certainly resonates with civic engagement and why I'm doing the work I'm doing in our, our community campus partnerships. But we want to graduate students uh, who make a difference in our own world and the world around them. And that is quote unquote our mission statement and encourages our students to develop the understanding, commitment, and confidence to lead fully informed and actively engaged lives. And as I just talked about, we have an EL requirement in our core curriculum, and we have certainly experiential learning happening across the college. And certain pieces of uh, those endeavors, whether course-based or program, uh, programmatic, are qualified, they fulfill the EL requirement because they can say that um, the eight guiding principles of the National Society for Experiential Education, they fulfill those guiding principles to a high impact experiential practice. And um, when we share our slides later with Marisol, I do have hyperlinks in there so you can see some of those resources, learn a little bit more about the National Society for Experiential Education, um, but also see how we help guide faculty and staff for bringing their experiential course and program online to fulfill the EL requirement and kind of make it that much more of a, a high impact practice. And um, Nick will talk a little bit more in a couple minutes about all the different pathways, but we do have seven, now we've kind of moved into eight, split apart one, um, but a lot of colleges have these different buckets of experiential um, modalities. So we have service learning, student leadership, internship, non-credit bearing community engagement, field and clinical experiences, that includes study of um, student teaching and field work as well. Then we have international, more study abroad, and then mentored scholarly activities, so the research, and then the mentored creative activities, more of the performance-based. And again, this is curricular and co-curricular, so it's a exciting piece of our experiential learning. We do see them both um, raised up equally the learning inside and outside the classroom happening um, as equally important. Um, the next slide we're going to share is our, our Start With Why. We have Simon Sinek's book here, but more about knowing what the motivation is. In order to form a program or form a process, we have to know the why. And so the why that Nazareth chose to go through this process could be the why. Um, it could be different for another institution, but it certainly brings the people around the table and decides whether or not you have the resources to do what you need to do. And so we started out years ago when the Center for Civic Engagement was first founded, tracking all of the curricular and co-curricular community engagement um, programs and courses. And it gave us an amazing idea um, from a nine years worth of data of where we've been inside our community, local, regional, national, global, um, international. And so that's been amazing to see that growth um, and see how there has been interprofessional collaborations across the college as well, uh, with the, if they're all the same city school, whether it's uh, hearing or audiology clinics or tutoring or student teaching, we're able to wrap around holistically around a community partner in a much more reciprocal and beneficial way for our students and our community. Um, but I started out with that as an Excel spreadsheet on my computer, and then it moved into Qualtrics, and then it moved into a Google spreadsheet from that Qualtrics. But it wasn't linked across the college. Um, and so what's been amazing is that um, there is shared knowledge now, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because it's really, it starts with that endeavor and that practice and habit at the college to have the faculty and staff respond what they're doing. Um, and so we wanted to know more. We wanted to know all the other types of pathways of the, of the students, including even their awards and conferences, uh, using all the different ways in which um, our students are engaging experientially. Now we're going to switch to my colleague. All right. Thanks, Nola. So uh, I'd like to introduce myself again. I'm Nick Lamando. I'm the Institutional Research Director, and thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to come in here and talk a little bit about how we help with this endeavor and really push this forward so that it advanced beyond the simple descriptive sort of detailing 
into more analytic strategic processing. Um, but Noah's alluded a little bit to our uh, introduction of participation in the process. It really did go back a few years ago when the initiative was brought forth to try to collect these data, but not just simply in their siloed individual you know, areas across campus, but really try to centralize the data. Um, it began also with an interest in creating a co-curricular, I won't finish that because it's a co-curricular trans and no one gets very mad when I say that, but that was the original reason why we were brought in, to try to collect that information to come up with a document that students might have that would capture all of the experiential learning opportunities that they participated in while they were students here at Nazareth. So we started with that. That was the basic premise. And from there, as we started to collect the data, we really did see how it could be used strategically. And I'll get to that in a moment, but as I alluded to, um, originally these were the pathways along which we collected the data. So she did mention that it started with campus employment. Um, we also decided to look at honors and awards. This also includes any types of merit-based scholarship the students um, earned while they were here, but really was designed to look for students who are in, you know, um, receiving specific awards or through athletics or through, you know, um, the clubs they're in, et cetera. We also have professional experiences. As Nola mentioned, many of our students participate in internships and almost all of the students in our allied health field participate in some sort of field work. All of our education students work with student teaching. Um, that's what's captured under that bucket. Civic engagement and service learning, as Nola was, um, also referred to earlier, this includes curricular and co-curricular experiences and also includes episodic and high impact practices. Um, as we've now been able to analyze the data, we've been able to parse those out so we can get a better idea. Um, student leadership, this includes leadership both, you know, at the uh, club level, at the university administration level, the government level, and in athletics as well. So team captains are track to this as well. Athletic and student organizations, this is pretty self-explanatory. All of our student athletes are collected here. Any um, students that are participating in extracurricular clubs here on campus. Global learning, it also, as well as including um, long-term study abroad programs, we have a number of new short-term programs that go abroad, we include those, and we're also including any on-campus international experiences. For conferences, this includes both external conferences that students either attended or presented at, and we also have a single day of um, our creative and research, realized with the S and cars. I know it's 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 a it's a um do you remember do you know what it is Noah? It's a creative and research um activity where students can actually present the work that they've done throughout the year. It's a one day event where all classes are canceled, and students will either present or they will do performances. Um, students will also have a gallery for those in our fine arts um programs to display their work, talk about their work, and communicate it. So this includes both those external and that internal goal of activity. And then the research and creative activity, this includes all student research on campus, as well as any creative activity through our like theater program, et cetera. All right, with these in mind, we first, that was the first step that we had in this process. So we actually had to decide where to start looking for these data to start tracking them. Well, it turns out, I'm sure many of you who have gone down this road even a little bit have realized that a lot of these data are siloed in different so for example, our campus employment is then stuck in the payroll system. NOLA's civic engagement data was sitting in a, as she alluded to again, in a cell sheet in her office. Some of the data are found in various locations on our transactional data server. We are a colleague school, so those exist in various tables in college. Well, a lot of them though, we really didn't even track them in any way. So we had to actually figure out not only where to get the data, but how to get the data so again, the first step, locating the data. But when we were brought in, when my office was brought in, a strategic decision was made that not only to start collecting these data and centralizing them, but to integrate it with our IR data warehouse. So for those of you that have a relationship with your IR office, you might go and ask to make sure that they have a data warehouse. Um, I know at some institutions, possibly your um, IT department will help your institutional data. But simply a data warehouse is just a collection of databases that actually have all of your institution, your enrollment, financial aid, admissions, all of that data. People want to interact with this. 
So we thought that the best way to collect this data and use it strategically was to integrate it with this data warehouse that my office has already collected. Now, we had two sources for that. A lot of that was actually found on Kali. So something was just hiding in plain sight. We just never collected it. We had never integrated it. So those were the easy actual, you know, data to pull. Some of it were data that we could use existing structures in Kali to bring it in, but we had to get creative. Um, and we worked with our IT department to use existing tables and screens to bring in new information. In some cases, we had to go out to the offices, you know, out there and figure out either how to bring the data in, how to clean up the data, or how to be more conscientious about collecting the data. So the data might exist, again, it might exist in the Excel sheet out in our, let's just say, our study abroad office, but that data was never actually entered into an existing table in the system. So we really just had to take an inventory of what data we needed, whether it either exists on the system, could be integrated in the system. But there were a number of different types of data that we really just couldn't enter through the system. We didn't have the architecture or the infrastructure to actually bring it into college. So the biggest um, area where that was the case was in civic engagement in NOLA's office. And that's really what led to the uh, close relationship professionally that Nell and I had in building these, this data. She had been collecting these data using Qualtrics surveys that went into an Excel sheet that we, she had one Excel sheet per academic year. But for her to go back and sort of strategically analyze that data, to collect the data, to look at the data over time was very difficult. So we did have a couple of options one of which was to pair with a third party provider that could collect this data and enter it. Um, while that is a good option and maybe an option for some of the institutions online, um, they are cost, in our case, maybe a little cost prohibitive. But the bigger factor is that trying to customize what a third party vendor can provide for you is nearly impossible. And to get the data in, again, this is speaking to institutional research office more than anything, you would get a flat text for a CSV file with all of your data. And then you'd have to scrub that data. And then you'd have to import it into your data warehouse. Um, that requires a number of steps that can't really be automated easily. So what we did is we actually talked with our IT department about possibly building a custom form that would allow us to enter the data. We began this initiative about two years ago um, with the first version of this. And once we had that skeleton, you know, uh, straw man version of it, we were able to work with NOLA and with some of the other office to figure out exactly what information we needed to be able to enter. But after a couple of years collaborating with them, we actually have been able to devise a NAS web form that allows us to enter some of these experiential learning data. Um, and I'm going to give you a demonstration of it right now. And I'm going to have Nola, do you mind walking them through that? Not at all. And I think we've had some challenge going in and out with some of the speakers, so we apologize for that. Um, but hopefully it doesn't go out altogether. It gets really quiet. So for those of you who are trying to multitask, you might have to pay stricter attention. Um, so this is the landing page that everyone comes in on. And it has a nice header just describing what our individuals need to be doing. Um, and we can uh, give you, again, resources that direct you to a website that can describe some of this. You won't be able to access this because it is password protected with the Nazareth um, email address. But we start just by um, beginning an experience, which we've already kind of sampled, saying Campus Compact Sample Project. And so we're just going to show you a little bit about um, how it looks. And because we have uh, partnered with IT, we have windows that are already pre-populated. You can start typing in the term window box. Um, and if we select 19 FA, that allows us to immediately have all of those courses on, that are active for the fall um, pre-populated. So if we typed in LST 301, which is a literacy service learning course, language and lit development, it automatically gets, um, comes up so that we have the data appear in the same way. It's not called. Um, 
you know, language and literature or literacy development. It's not called LST301 without an asterisk. So we're able to have it all in the same formatting. We do have a required um, buttons for determining with a, with a definition that we say is service learning, academic service learning on campus, a definition for civic engagement, kind of a forced answer to again, allow us to know what we're working with for the faculty, um, the service learning scholars with the when each division of the college to be able to follow up. And if someone selects civic engagement, which appears for curricular or co-curricular, service learning only will appear if it's curricular. We do ask um, people to choose multi, they can choose multiple focus areas, but wanting to know a little bit more about where our students, um, what, what themes, what areas in the, um, of their uh, engagement that they're doing. And whether or not it's interprofessional, we have an interprofessional committee, if they're collaborating across disciplines with other faculty, bringing the students together to reflect and to hear from other disciplines and perspectives, working with the same committee partner, um, we're able to hand off that report once everyone submits their data uh, to our interprofessional committee for further support. And for HR um, and our risk management and liability purposes, so that the right uh, due diligence and um, kind of trainings can be done for students who are interacting with minors, we do have that um, required flag. And then if you get through all of that, you also are then just selecting what type of activity are you inputting? Is it a civic community engagement piece? If you hover over it, you'll see the definition. Is it a conference? Is it a creative activity, um, which is more performance, artistic-based, global learning, which is domestic and international? Um, is it an honor award that's more departmental specific? Um, research that isn't just automatically a, a research course. Um, and then a student leadership opportunity. And certainly, again, you can say it's both. Uh, we type in your experience name, your sponsoring department, and then we can put in a description that we can pull and sort through at a later time. And that's when I get to ask IR to run all those different types of reports for me, depending on, on what type of um, data I'm trying to sort through. We want to know the length of time for a student. We know that there's no parity between experiences that say, oh, this is more valuable. But we do know that there's a threshold for time, that a one-time event is certainly not as powerful or as meaningful as something that has gone consistently over time. And so once we choose that it's happening um, and when it's happening to give us an idea about the landscape of the semester, we can save that experience and go into page two. And again, all in all, this could take you for one course, it could take you literally two minutes to do. Because just in my talking about it is how long that would have taken you for the first page, even um, probably I talked longer than you would. Um, community partners, any person, any organization, agency that has been a vendor for the college for the past 25 years is already pre-populated here. And so we already typed in Mary's Place. It's a nonprofit organization supporting recently uh, resettled immigrants and refugees, um, asylum seekers here. And if we worked at Wegmans, our you know, fancy grocery chain, um, we could add them in as a, as a second agency there. And you can see how it's, it's added. Our contacts um, is who are at our sites that we work with on a consistent basis. This helps us with different communication lines with them, helps us see, and it, while this can be quite transitory depending on nonprofit versus you know, corporate, nonprofits tend to have a higher cycle through. It really does allow us to really be able to reach out to individuals um, that we need to, especially to follow up under even a, a risk management way. Facilitators are the people at the college who are supporting this program. Again, allowing us to reach out to find out more about the program, find out more about assessment purposes, et cetera. And because it's a course, the participants is so easy, the roster is pre-populated the minute you're choosing the course. Now you can go in and say one of the students had more time commitment and you wanted to be able to reflect that, the college at right now, we don't, um, we don't track hours necessarily, um, but we do want to know um, and be able to go back and find out cumulatively what the college has done um, for a variety of different reasons. And we can add students' names here if it's co-curricular. We can cut and paste a spreadsheet of their unique identifiers, which is their email address. 
So we can also add their student IDs, but many students, and we don't even know those sometimes, but it gives us a number of ways of looking up a student or copying and pasting. So that's, that's it. Each one of these experiences that is pulled in through this web form is tied to a student's unique identifier, as is anything that's tied in and pulled in through colleague, pulled in through our web form, pulled in through payroll. Um, and so again, we're reminding you all of, of what exactly is pulled automatically and what we're encouraging faculty and staff to do. We do not have students submitting their own data. We don't have staff capacity to be able to double check that and to validate it. So we're asking every faculty and staff person, if you are the facilitator, if you teach a course or you're facilitating a program, you're the one who's inputting data if it's not automatically pulled through the other areas. And that helps us, one, determine um, responsibility for who's responsible for submitting the data. We really only want to track what Nazareth is offering our students. We don't want to track where they have an off-campus job, although that's very important. We don't sponsor it. We don't allocate resources for it if we're determining that's a high-impact practice. And so, again, we're looking at what the college is doing um, to advance uh, our students' growth and development and learning. All right, I apologize earlier. Um, I, I heard there were some issues with my uh, microphone going in. Is it okay now? Okay, Noah's nodding that it's okay now. All right, I apologize that, um, for that. Um, okay, so now that we have all of the data into the system, again, because we built this in-house to our IT department, they can actually have that, the contents of that web form be automatically piped into our IR data warehouse. So every time, as soon as someone enters a brand new experience, the next morning, it's now integrated into our IR data warehouse. So now, again, all of the information that we have about experiential learning is now integrated with a student's uh, enrollment information, their academic program, their major, their, finance, their financial aid information, their retention data. Everything is now integrated so that now we can actually start looking at the data strategically. We don't just have to be able to count, even though we will. So I'm going to show you now the way that we have leveraged this centralized data and the benefit of centralizing it. So really quickly, I just have a couple of slides here. These were the data that were already found out on our colleague system that we were able to just pull in or clean up. And these are the types of data that typically now are being entered through that web form that Nola just showed off right there. Okay. So now, and these are the two websites also that she, uh, that she also talked about that are both accessed publicly. When we put up the deck, the slide deck, you'll be able to access those through the hyperlinks. Okay, now, everything is in our IR data warehouse. Now we can actually start looking at the data and reporting it, both descriptively and strategically. So what I'd like to do is show off some dashboard that we have built in the Tableau data visualization tool to help us look at these. All right, give me one second here. Okay, let me see if I can just quick slow that just, uh, just a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through a few of the dashboards that we've created. This first dashboard right here is really meant to just simply count the number of experiences our students participated in year over year. So right now over here, you can select the number of years that you'd like to look. Right now, we have it all aggregated across all three years. We have an option if you want to look at it year by year to look at the number of experiences. Each experience type has been denoted by one of the colors. If you hover over that color, it will automatically tell you in a text box how many students participated and how many experiences those students actually participated in. So you can, again, look at a year over year or you can aggregate over a few years. Now, we also have the ability to go in and just look at civic engagement data. Let's, if Nola wants to just see how many, she can look year over year. And she can also look by the different types, so we have subtype. We have our high impact co-curricular, curricular, and our episodic. All of that data can be accessed and updated on the fly in a moment's notice. But what really helps the data become a little more strategic than these simple counts 
is that now we can use some of that student data we have to start disaggregating the data. So for example, if we want to look at the number of participants by academic program field now, all of a sudden now we can break it down by our art field, all the programs are education within our fields, all of our health profession program, et cetera. We can actually do it by two different levels right here. So if we wanted to also look at, you know, residency, commuter versus residency. Now at a moment's notice, we can look at a specific EL type and figure out what population, what parts of the student population may be underserved. All right. But this is probably the most simple, this is the simplest, you know, of all the, uh, of all the dashboards. Another type of information that we typically will get at is what's the participation rate? So what we have here is we have each different EL type right here, and each bar represents the percentage of all students that participated in that experience at some point for that given academic year. So again, we can just look at specific types if we want to look at civic engagement. And NOLA wants to look at it by EM plus, so you can see now which academic programs typically are participating at the highest levels. Okay, again, more, and she can look, we can disaggregate it by year to see if any of those have changed. We're still actually entering some backlog data from 2016, so that's why that's a little low. But these are ways to descriptively look at the data to just get a sense of how many. When we really can start leveraging this is when um, we can actually start using it to look at strategic information. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at how these data actually look for our retention and our graduation rates. So for example, right here, what we have the ability to do is look at select a perfect experience type over here on the left. So right now I have campus employment. Here I can see, okay, did they participate in campus employment during their first year before the end of their second, third year? And now up here, I can look and see, okay, Here's the participant status. Did they participate? Yes. Did they not? No. And these are the retention rates to so sophomore year, to junior year, to senior year, and to graduation, our four year graduation rate and our six year graduation rate. Now, instead of anecdotally saying, well, we know the campus employment really helps elevate our fourth year graduation rate, we can actually begin to quantify that. So if you are writing a proposal to, you know, to acquire more resources, now you can actually demonstrate that with real data. Um, and once again, these data can be disaggregated. So if we want to look at it by academic program area, now we can see specifically the benefit of campus employment to students in different program areas. And again, it can go two levels, so we can further break that down by gender. You can see all of the different ways in which we can break our data down. So again, this is something strategically really starting to look, you know, at outcomes. Um, another question that we will typically get asked is what percentage or how many of our students participated at graduation? So if, for example, senior leadership wants to be able to say X percent of our students, you know, participated in some professional experience before they graduated, that's what this report can do now. So now I just select one of the experience types. I'm looking at professional experiences here. I can look by graduation year, the total number of experiences that students participated in, the total um, students that participated, and the average participation per student. And again, you know, we can disaggregate this by area. So if we want to look at males versus females, again, now we can see what percentage or how many experiences on average our students had before they graduated. Okay. One of the reasons that actually started us down this road in the beginning, I mentioned to earlier, was the ability to collect all of the information about which experiences our students were participating in while they were here at Nazareth. We also here at Nazareth have a new Center for Life's work in which we have career coaches that work with the students, help them identify, again, what their life's work is, whether that's in a career, whether that's graduate school, et cetera. What we're providing for them now is this dashboard right here to give them all of the information about a student. So if they are having a meeting with a student, now at a glance they can go in, they can select the student's name or their ID and have all of the information about which experiences, how many they've participated in in each area since they've been here at Nazareth 
And down here, you can actually get a list. And this is sort of that unofficial experiential record for the student. All of their participation over the years, which years, what it actually was, what their role was. We also have a number over here that has the total number of experiences that they participated in while they're doing that. It's color coded so that as they are participating in more, as they're towards the higher end of the distribution, it goes from red to orange to yellow to green. Now, what's really interesting here that I've created for this report is the ability to compare the students' numbers to the average for any group they would like to see on campus. So for example, this student here is a math major. So what we can do is we can compare this to all STEM students on campus. Now watch in real time, those numbers change. Now let's say that the student, let's say that this student aspires to go to graduate school. So what we want to see is, all right, let's take a look at students that graduated from a STEM field, not just those that are actively enrolled and graduating, but those students who graduated. And let's see all those students who actually went to graduate school in a STEM field. Now you can see and they can compare, you know, one to one, where that student might want to either expand their, their breadth or their depth of experiential learning um, compared to students that they aspire to be. And you can, you can select any comparison group. I mean, we could look at all graduated students that went to graduate school if that was the case as well. Um, and everything changes you know, in real time. Um, that's really the nice benefit of a data visualization tool like Tableau. This is something that you know, five or six years ago, if I was asked to get these data, it would require me actually going and running a set of reports, you know, probably taking a day or two. Now we're making this available to all career coaches on campus, and we're trying to figure out a way to actually make this available to all of the uh, academic advisors. So again, they can hear that information from both a career coach and an academic advisor, what they should be doing in terms of you know, participation in some of these experiential learning opportunities. So all of this is made possible by, again, integrating the data that you're collecting about your experiential learning opportunities with that existing data warehouse. All that information about what else we know about the student so that we can disaggregate by some of those variables to be more strategic. Um, to be honest, this is actually just a subset. I do have a larger version of this report that has a different suite of dashboards that can actually track outcomes. So what percentage of students have participated in you know, uh, civic engagement actually went to grad school. What grad schools did they go to? Um, we do have the ability to do all of that as well. But I really just wanted to share some of what's possible once you've gone down this, um, you know, this road, so to speak. All right, so I think with that, um, that is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Um, Nola, in conclusion? Um, thank you. No, I think that what I, um, it's all a work in progress, and I think it's essential for every institution to find some way to look at how they're engaging students, where they're engaging students, to look at um, shoring up the opportunities for our students to engage early and engage often in order to retain them, but also to, in order to strengthen the way in which our students learn. Our students learn hands-on, and it's so important in order to um, shift the, the pedagogy, shift this teaching style, shift the way we're thinking, um, and teach and support our faculty and staff who are wanting to do this work, who have been and who are interested in doing it, in, um, in doing it in a way that's effective and collaborative and reciprocal with our community partners. Um, and it goes certainly beyond that, and we can learn from each other. It's an amazing piece to be at the table with Campus Compact, thinking about the way in which we engage our students in the community campus partnerships. But then how are we at a college using that information to strengthen the students' learning and strengthen those partnerships? Um, so it's been an exciting way to involve data in with kind of ethical community-based engagement efforts. Could I, 
I know I think we're reading the same question, Nick, and you've been very involved with trying to get data and I've been asking you to go fishing an awful lot. But as a college, when we're making strategic decisions, um, facing budget surplus, budget deficit, however we're flexing on that, we've used this data to guide our decision makings for um, which work study, which campus employment jobs are the most effective. If somebody is asking in a department to increase that, there's, there's, um, there's strength in their request because we know how much it retains our students, especially the students who are um, more at, at risk for a variety of different reasons. Um, to make sure that our students who have been identified as having some risk factors, risk environments, making sure that they have three of those experiences so that we can make sure that they help are guided to graduation. And so in order to think about how we're using it for institutional change and decisions, we're even looking at uh, a J term, like a, a January term or changing the semester to accommodate more of these experiences for our students. Um, if they're in physical therapy, if they're in occupational therapy, or if they're even student teaching, the opportunity for somebody to go abroad or have an international experience or even engage in a community off campus and in a way based experience is so difficult. But if we increase the number of opportunities for them to do that in a spring break, a winter break, a summer break, um, we're able to ensure that they have some stronger experiences. So we've used that, even those two small little examples for work, study, student deployment, as well as semester timeline, uh, because of the data that we have. I think we have one question. We do want to open it up for questions. And we have a question asking who fills out the web form and what success do you have with faculty filling it out? Very good question. Who fills it out? The faculty and staff facilitators. If you are teaching a course, you're filling it out. If you're leading an alternative service immersion experience or a community-based experience, you're filling it out. If you took students to a conference, you're filling it out. So it's just the programs and opportunities that you're responsible for that the faculty or staff completes it, not, again, not students. Success rates, um, we did the dog and pony show everywhere at the college assembly in August last year to a number of different open forums for faculty and staff. We presented to every single academic department and staff meeting. And then we had all the one-on-ones. So we created web forms, to-dos, FAQs, specific for school beds, specific for health and human services. And so the, um, the buy-in was stronger already for our community engagement, our civic engagement efforts, because we had nine years of habit. But with every new process, you know, there is certainly a learning curve. So we've been reaching out and also helping people. So how faculty and staff completing it with the success rates are, they're pretty good. I don't know the percentages. What I do know is that through the coaxing and the reaching out, we've been able to have people complete so that their departments represented. I sat down with a lot of faculty and staff recently knowing we want to be able to tell your story. We want to highlight it on our website. We want to be able to factor it into the data of the college for resource allocation, etc. Or you yourself might want it for promotion and tenure purposes. You want to request a report, anything associated with your name for engaged scholarship or whatnot. Um, there are a lot of incentives. So we have had success rates. Um, we want more. I want every piece of data to be able represented. So I'm always looking how to grow it. So I don't know, I don't know exact rates, but it has been successful, but we do need um, complete buy-in and we're still working with everybody. Yeah, let me also really quick jump back to the, uh, the question about, you know, how we're using it strategically. So our office actually calculates, or we create a, uh, a student success model for incoming students where we have about 35 different variables to help us predict student, you know, fragility, I would say. And what we're doing now with these data is we're able to actually see whether steering some of those more fragile students or potentially fragile students into some of these high impact practices early on, we actually demonstrated now the impact that has on our fourth year graduate, four year graduation rate, which has really become a priority at our institution. So now we actually know. So again, with campus employment, when we saw the relationship between campus employment early on in student and graduation rate, we did, we created a couple of new programs. We created our enhanced student employment program to help try to encourage students to not only encourage them to uh, participate, 
but try to encourage departments to use you know, more student workers. Um, so it's really helping us in that strategic sense when we have a priority you know, around student success and graduation. And I just want to offer, and I want you know, definitely more questions. Please feel free to ask. We definitely have some more time. But I, I wanted to also have people think about um, what the opportunity would be to bring people to the table, to even think about one high impact practice and to do this um, collaboratively across the college to look at and to analyze data. Or if you are the institutions that have a process and have outcomes and engagement levels that connected across um, units and departments and institutionally um, based, think about what data is missing and can you connect um, if you have third party providers for electronic portfolios, if your health and human service field and have to do that for accreditation purposes or student teaching. Um, to build integration points for the APIs for those vendors so that there is a more comprehensive set of data. Um, we're again lucky that we can navigate. It's a small institution, but it's so diverse in the fact that we have all of these professional programs alongside the liberal arts and our engagement rates are off the charts have always been. So even though it's quite, um, even though we're smaller and can navigate, we have all these different components to that can be replicated in a large institution. We do have another question. Yeah, so it's, um, Ashley is asking, do we have to add additional staff and IR to handle this? Um, we just have a small staff. We just have myself, the director, and I have two analysts that work under me. And we were fortunate when we started this endeavor, we did have somebody who was very committed to the process. And to be honest, she had the right skill set, I think, for going out and hurting these cats and getting these departments to, you know, participate. So that was really fortunate. Um, but no, we have a very, we probably have an average size staff for, a, you know, an institution our size. And it took the IT staff, it took about six months, I think, to develop the first iteration of this web form. But then we realized that we, you know, that was because we really didn't define exactly what we needed. So it almost took them a few months to develop a, what I call the straw man version of it. And then we realized, okay, this is really what we need. Um, and I have to tell you, they added so many features to this that are really capturing some really nuanced information about each of these experiences. So it's a very omnibus type of reporting you know, web form. Um, it's not here just to capture the basics. It's really capable of capturing a lot of information. So that component took about another eight to nine months, I would say. I think it took, I, I wanna say it took about, you know, 15 months um, of, from start to finish, but that was really two versions of it. And I do think that it could be much quicker. Our IT department wasn't even fully staffed during this time. And so it was slow because of their capacity and even understanding of the questions we wanted asked um, through the web forum, but also building the technology and all the coding behind the scenes to connect it to the data warehouse. So I do think if there were a dedicated staff, it could happen quicker, but know that it happened in that timeline with depleted staffing in our IT department. And we have another question. Um, how long have you been using Tableau and how do you use it beyond this application for experience education? Nick, this is yours. We've been using it for about three years now actively. Um, we use it for everything. Our um, entire fact book is available on Tableau now internally. All of my faculty workload reporting is done through Tableau. So all the deans have access to strategic reporting um, involving workload. I do all of our student success analytics through, um, through Tableau. Not only is it a really effective reporting tool to allow people to see the data and interact with it, but it actually does help you um, drill down and investigate your data. So on the fly, for example, that retention tool that I showed off earlier, um, you just can handle those what if questions. What about this? What about that? What if we do this? It's so quick at actually being able to help you investigate your data without having to go in, enter variables in a line of code, and then seeing what's spit up. It does everything in a real-time manner, and it's just highly visual, so it's more intuitive for people who are not really good consumers of numbers and tables. Yes. And um, the next question is, what's our, our, um, our CRM, or what's our, our learning management system? The, we use Colleague. It's the equivalent to Banner at another school. 
And Tableau is just the visualization tool. It's one of the top three in the, in the nation or in the world pretty much for data visualization. In fact, um, even a lot of AI are using artificial intelligence and the Air Force, et cetera, are using Tableau. So it's, um, but it's affordable if a small college like us is making the investment in a data visualization tool like that. So really quickly, yeah, um, Colleague is our transactional data system. That's what, you know, that's what we put, how we enter the data through all the offices. Our office at Census Day, which is the fourth Monday of each semester, does a download of all that data and freezes the data. That's what's entered into our data warehouse. So that exists in our department. Tableau is actually connected to our data warehouse. Um, that's like how our architecture works. So I have a number of scripts and queries that actually create, that summarize the data, that feed into the, uh, the Tableau report that I showed earlier. And most IR departments now, um, to be honest, three or four years ago when we started using it, only the bigger schools were using it, but now I, I go to most IR departments in most schools our size, and everyone is using it in some capacity, and most IR offices are pretty familiar with the tool and know how to you know, connect it to their data source. And Tableau Ethan has like different modules that you can activate, such as a GIS mapping of all your community partnerships in the area. Um, because everything entered is tied to an address and a zip code, it's very easy to turn on that module. It just needs staff and time to, to do it. But that certainly is our, our evolution and our goal of, of being able to do that to communicate where we are in our community. And we have a couple, just a couple more minutes. I'm wondering if there's um, anyone else with any questions. All right. Well, we're certainly available for anyone to look us up at Nazareth College. Um, we'll talk again to about us all and communicate our slides, which have our email addresses and contact information. And we'd love to learn from you as well. So please do reach out and share your stories um, if you have any insight to what we're doing, not even just questions, but we'd love to learn from you. And thank you, and I apologize for any of the uh, microphone issues. I'm really sorry about that. It was working when we, when we set it up. <laughs> Right. Well, I want to thank the panelists for sharing your knowledge and your experience with this topic of data. It's something that's very important to us in the field as we're trying to capture the stories um, and uh, information that we're trying to sort of make our case at the institution. So this is a really great example of that. Um, I think it was meaningful and uh, engaging as we saw from the questions from our participants. And I want to thank all the attendees for your participation and engagement. Um, I'd like to also encourage you to check out um, the upcoming webinars um, that we have. Uh, you will be receiving an evaluation survey following this in your inbox, so it would be great if you could um, answer that. We will be providing uh, recordings of the webinar um, on our website in uh, a few days, so I would say by early next week. Uh, and then feel free to, uh, again, reach out to Noel or Nick. Uh, I'm sure that they'll are willing uh, to sort of talk more with you in depth. So again, thank you so much for your participation and until next time, bye-bye. Thank you, thanks Marisol. Mm -hmm.